Okay, I started okay, recording. Cloud, yes, right. I, I yeah, I, I just did. But oh. yeah, it would be good if you can do it too, just in case. All right. So sorry about that glitch. Um, Okay, so Women in Big Data organizes uh, several events in business skills and technical skills tracks. We organize uh, several training sessions across the globe, collaborating with several corporate sponsors. Uh, WIBD provides a network for technical women from early career uh, to women in leadership positions. Here is how you can get involved with this organization. You can become a member on, by joining our LinkedIn group, following us on Twitter or Facebook, and attending our meetup events like this one. Companies can become sponsors by hosting at least two WIBD events per year. It, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Bob Loftus. Bob is founder of Now Forward Coaching and provides career transition services. He works with uh, his clients to use their talent, energy, and expertise to break through self-imposed limits to their success in career growth, personal relationships, and overall health. Bob has volunteered with WIBD for the past few years by speaking at several of our business skills events. Bob has won Trainer of the Year awards for, the, for his great work with WIBD and has private coaching practice that is taking clients. He regularly volunteers his skills at promatch.org and meetups like Women in Big Data and CSI 10. Bob also supports other nonprofits such as Bay Area Cancer Connections and Breathing Spaces. Please join me in welcoming Bob. Thanks, Virgula. And I think, let's see. Okay, yeah, I, I just I stopped can... sharing. Okay, so let's see. Does everyone see the sort of welcome slide? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. The last one of our series of career development. Uh, my screen sharing is paused. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay. And everybody can. It tells me that my screen sharing is paused. Uh, I'm going to try this. Okay. Good. So, uh, yeah, this is the um, culmination of a lot of good um, work on uh, with your manager, your director in promoting yourself before the performance review or getting that next job. It comes down to negotiating. And um, there's an interesting quote that really helps to be focused on positive things. So we're glad you're here. Um, you might wanna take some notes if you can. Uh, uh, constructive candor, psychological safety, I believe it's called at Google. So uh, when we have our breakouts and any questions that come up during the session, please feel and know this is a safe environment for you to ask good questions and contribute. We really appreciate the wisdom of the larger group. So we're gonna put up a little poll now so that I will have some idea of where everyone is coming from as far as negotiation. So pretty soon you'll see just one poll question. It's like five possibilities. So it gives me a good idea of where we stand and how to uh, kind of focus the details of the session. Okay. Um, Is that working okay? Let me just see. Okay. I sort of lost my control to... Um, Yes, I think um, Regina and I are both logging in uh, with the same uh, like ID. I think that's causing this issue. Mm. And so, um, let me uh, let me log off. And can you uh, can you I'm try? Sorry, what's the issue? Oh, so I created a poll, but uh, you and I both are logged in using your um, ID. Yeah. as a host. So it says you're logged in from another device. Your polling session is inactive. So one of us has to uh, log off and log back in. Okay, I'll log off. All right, thank you. Thank you. Make Bob a, a co-host, by the way? Yes, I did. Thank yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> ah, the joys of Zoom. Yeah. Did it um, come up? Not yet. Okay. Let's see. Guys. Um, 
it might take a couple of minutes. We appreciate all of your patience. Thank you. Okay, she's gone. So let me see if I can. Okay, can you see it now? Let me just create it again. So I'm hoping that people only see the slide that says mutual respect. They don't see any other part of my desktop. No, we don't. Okay. Oh, we're back. Okay. Okay. Do you see the poll? Yes. Okay, I think. Cool. Okay. Let me. Oh, can you launch it? Sorry. Yeah. I, I, I okay. still see the same error. Here we go. So uh, take a look. How do you feel about an experience negotiating? So um, it's not actually a multiple choice. You just have one choice, please. <laughs> and yeah. let's get a sense of where we're all at here. Um, so a uh, couple of people giving in quickly, um, sometimes get a good result. Uh, someone is getting better at it. So. If you have a moment, just give your uh, vote on how you're doing. It looks like it changed. Oops. Yeah, um, I <laughs> changed it. <laughs> okay, well, this is good. I have a very good idea of uh, where we're at. So I think we can end it now. Do you wanna end it? Sure. Okay. It's just helpful to know that we're all in the right place tonight. Okay, um, Bob, sorry, you have to do it again. Sorry, okay. you have to end it. I think I've got it there. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, share results. So actually, you can see that the majority of people are, are in the middle there. Uh, and this, again, is the right place to be. Okay, thanks. Uh, share results. So let's see if we can get rid of that. Okay, so just a little background on me briefly. Um, yes, we're in the Valley of Disruption, that's for sure. Uh, so I started at Wells Fargo uh, in customer and sales and product training, moved on to do a lot of early work at Apple Computer, stayed at Apple for quite a while, then moved over to Compact, which uh, had purchased Tandem, and then HP bought all of that technology. So I ended up being at HP as a enterprise software product manager for a few years, and then went on uh, to Symantec for a couple of years. I worked at the local nonprofit ProMatch. I worked also at Solyndra, the solar company in the East Bay that was quite controversial. I have my own business now, now forward that was mentioned. I did work at the career transition company, Lee Hecht Harrison, and uh, now I'm more focused on Torchiana, another career and communication uh, group. So there's all the times that I have been workforce reduced due to no fault of my own. And uh, so I've been around the bush a little bit with um, preparing for getting your next job and a couple of personal difficulties, family tragedies. So, you know, looking at the big picture of what matters the most, uh, you know, changing a job because you didn't have a vote, vote in that is not always the worst thing that's happened. I found that many of my clients enjoy the forced adventure of getting their next job and making sure it's exactly what they want to do next. So I'm going to ask you now to um, put any particular challenges you have about negotiating in the chat or you can unmute yourself. I think you're able to do that. And just say what particular challenges you see that are happening. Oh, I wanted to mention also in the chat, if you can, if I can find the chat, there we go. 
Uh, we may have a couple of documents that we'll be using in the course of the session. Yeah, take a look at chat here. And yeah, so those will be appearing um, now that we're all here in the session in a few minutes. There'll be two documents, one that's an overview of the session tonight, sort of notes for you, very brief. And the other one is instructions for the breakout. So uh, I'm looking at the group chat and I see no challenges for this group of relatively moderate negotiators, basically have no challenges. They're just focused on getting better. True, oh, here we go from, okay. Odily, being afraid to ask for too much, being unreasonable, not being cooperative. Yes, three things to avoid for sure. Um, <clears throat> and we are gonna cover those in detail. So great place to be. Uh, I don't put my foot down. I agree to the other person suggesting too easily. Yes, uh, I tell you, many of us are trained to, to do that. It's not by accident forgetting all the techniques I've trained for with negotiation. <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Very um, uh, down to earth uh, comment. Uh, afraid I'm asking for more than I deserve. Oh, Lord. So, um, D, uh, most of the time we leave money on the table in this. It'll come up later in the session. Uh, in the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So. So what Dean is saying about kind of nervousness, a little bit of uh, anxiousness coming on during the negotiation, and then we forget. Not knowing what's possible for Ellen. Yeah, that's, we're gonna focus on that. Not being persuasive enough, even though I present data from Glassdoor or levels from another salary estimator. Well, uh, yeah, sometimes um, the company is just not going to go to what we expect is fair market value. And that's going to be our decision. Do we take lower than we're our value because we want this job? There's other things about it. Or do we hold off? Let's see. I feel uh, being considerate works against me. So we have to, we have to talk about considerate and what we mean by considerate, but these are really good points. So, uh, I will focus on these um, as we go through. And if I'm missing anything, you guys just let me know. So thanks a lot for that information. So um, anyone who's been on one of my sessions before knows that I'm uh, big into mindfulness and uh, calming ourselves down, especially before a big day like tomorrow. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that and try a little exercise um, focus on why negotiation is essential and how you need to know what you need to get from a negotiation for it to be worthwhile. Talk about the ranges that recruiters have and their resources. And especially focus that compensation is more than salary, although salary is very key. Uh, also give you some examples of the language of persuasion. Uh, so turning that consideration into persuasion. And you'll have some practice in the breakout session coming. Yeah, so it's a, a quote from Steve Jobs, um, who was a meditator and a uh, very intense focused person. And he would take time just to uh, relax into the stillness and quiet so he could be in touch with other parts of his own wisdom. The intuition is on the other side of all those busy thoughts that keep flying through our heads. So here's uh, an exercise that's a little bit about clearing yourself out that could be something you do before a negotiation, even before um, an interview. So this is a practice, one of a few called havening, like a safe haven. So I can't really see too many people's faces. Everybody's just the name there printed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you can see me, hi, that's Vanessa. Nice to see you. Thank you. Um, if you can see me, I'm going to model this for you. And you are welcome to do it yourself. It's only going to take a few seconds. Or you can just uh, close your eyes and have some nice relaxed breathing. 
So Havening, uh, <clears throat> in this case, I'd like you to put your hands together sort of in front of your chest and the palms are facing each other. And you're just going to slide your fingers of each hand over the uh, fingers of the other hand, then turn your hands over and slide them back. Slide again and then turn and do it twice over there. And just go at a relaxed pace, really focusing on the sensation of your uh, fingertips, your fingerprints uh, against one another. And the interesting thing about this kind of practice is that it actually gets the endorphins going because our arms are above our chest. So there's a little energy going there. And um, <clears throat> it in encourages oxytocin, the hugging hormone against cortisol, the uh, stressful hormone. So by its nature, just doing this tends to calm us down, especially if we just focus on the sensation of skin to skin. And uh, yeah, I have to take a yawn once in a while because it's kind of relaxing. So we don't want to do that too long or I'll be completely out of it. Thank you, those who participated. I hope you'll try that again. Uh, I'm going to show you some other techniques later on for getting yourself in a good, high energy, positive, yet relaxed at the same time mode for really good negotiation skill. Okay, so you're here talking about negotiations. In what I deal with with most of my clients is the whole path to getting that job, which starts in knowing your accomplishments and your brand, you know, be able to say something that really is impactful when someone says, Bob, what do you do for a living? You know, your brand is what comes out after that. And your accomplishments build your brand. So we like to talk about accomplishments being communicated in the form of a beginning, a middle and end. Here was the problem. This is what I did, and this is the result that I got. And for some people, this is hard to do to quantify the result of their work. And we don't have the time to get into this tonight, but we've done it in earlier sessions. And it's really the key to success in this whole path that I'm putting out here. It's good to have a plan when you're looking for new work, whether you're working or not working. And a source resume that is maybe more inclusive and a good LinkedIn profile than a targeted resume for a particular job you're going for. And all of that is good preparation for doing networking, informational interviewing, which leads to real interviewing. And that ideally gets you into the situation we're talking about tonight, negotiating for the best possible compensation package you can get. Now, wouldn't it be nice if everything were logical, rational, beginning to end uh, on the right side there, but usually these things are all mixed up. The reason I put it here is so that you understand that <clears throat> make sure you've got all these pieces together before you find yourself in that negotiation situation. It gives you a lot more confidence when you are. So here's a, a, you know, an interesting uh, idea to keep in mind. When an offer appears, the power dynamic shifts a bit. So up until that point, you're in the weaker position because you're trying to get accepted for this job that ideally you really want. And then when an offer comes, the power dynamic shifts a little bit because they want you to say yes. However, many of us are feeling less confident at that time. We're uh, glad to get an offer um, and we, we're very excited about it. And then as you said in the chat with those comments, we think maybe we shouldn't ask for that. That won't seem appropriate, but doesn't look right, et cetera. Well, in all of this stuff, it's really good to be nervous because that kind of gives you the energy that you need not to be so nervous you can't think straight, which I think Dean had mentioned that we lose track of things. Um, and focus on your value and your previous successes. That's where you want to keep the conversation going. <clears throat> so 
positive self messaging is proven social scientifically to work. So if you tell yourself, you don't really deserve more than this, guess what is true? If you tell yourself they are underpaying me and I really deserve a fairer mark of this compensation they're giving me. So those messages we give to ourselves are very, very powerful. So try to catch those thoughts when they're going in your head, because remember, they're not facts, they are thoughts. Isn't it interesting that I just caught myself thinking I don't deserve above the mid range for the salary in this position? Why would I do that? You know, like, why, why am I thinking that way? The first thing is to recognize them. Now, um, before you go into a negotiation situation to build your confidence, you might try what Amy Cuddy refers to as power posing. And we've talked about this before with women in big data. So um, <clears throat> it's interesting. It refers to the action you might take. So we used to go into an office to negotiate. Now we're doing it from home. So you don't have to go to another room. You just don't want to be on screen, but you will assume a uh, universally held position of confidence, uh, power posing. And uh, Wonder Woman here is giving a good example. So she's showing how you should stand. We used to say in the restaurant room of the office building before you go in to negotiate or uh, in your restroom, in your office, on the floor before you go to the manager or, you know, have the interview for the negotiation. But now just take a few moments and do this stance. Superman, Wonder Woman, but that sends messages to our bodies, which in turn send messages to our brain, which are going to reinforce those positive self messages. It's fascinating that it works. So, it's a little controversial, but in general, the science seems to be that most people benefit from doing this. <clears throat> so when that offer appears, they want you, and we want you to be confident, but uh, I chose this woman here because she might be just a little too confident and maybe uh, on the aggressive side. So assertive is a great word. Aggressive would not be so good because that could be threatening to the person you're negotiating with. And it shows how you may behave on that team. The negotiation process is kind of the last step in the interview, because let's say you didn't negotiate at all. And even a person who's a um, uh, administrative assistant is a bit of a project manager. Sometimes they are responsible for purchasing goods and services for all hands meeting. So it's, it mean I'm hiring this, this woman who will not negotiate at all and we're gonna put her in a position with our money. Does that mean she's not gonna negotiate with those vendors and we won't do as well as we would if she were a little smarter about how to spend the money. So I hope you see that being a negotiator uh, and, and coming from a fair position of having done your research, which we'll get into, it shows how you're going to be on that team. So natural assertiveness is better than being overwhelming and possibly threatening. And it shows, um, it gives you the opportunity to compromise. So hmm. In our political landscape these days, compromise does unfortunately does not seem to be a, a powerful word. But in most good negotiations, in most artful forms of the deal, there is compromise, so there's a win-win. And that's what we're looking for here. They want you to say yes and take this position because roughly 75% of the time when the number one choice says no, they go back and start over again, which is a costly uh, effort. You know, if it's a job where there's lots of people and it's, uh, you know, like more or less routine kind of position, maybe they'll go to number two. But anything that requires some depth of skill and experience in a certain area, they want you to say yes and be happy. So just be ready to uh, be able to compromise. 
how to be better at negotiation. Yes. Okay, so that might be Erica. You'll have to um, mute your line, I think. Good, thank you. So I like this woman's picture um, on unsplash.com. I thought she represents um, a, you know, an interesting appearance to be negotiating. You know, she's like looking straight at you. She has a confident stance. Maybe she did some power posing. Maybe she's sending some messages into her brain. I deserve better than I had before. This is my one chance to get that salary up. So um, right at this point, I wanted to get to see if there are any questions from you guys. Uh, you can put them in the chat or you could unmute and just bring them up. But I probably have said enough to get the juices flowing if there's anything that you find um, intriguing or you'd want to know more about or a different take on it. I'll open it up to you for a little while. Anyone? Hi, Bob. It's Danielle. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Um, I think that your point on um, the impact of not negotiating, how that makes you appear to a hiring manager is the light bulb just went off with me because I'm a project manager mm -hmm. and part of my job is negotiating. Um, I never applied how that might be viewed um, on my, when I'm trying to negotiate on my behalf. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's good, good for you. Like now you'll be able to use those project management negotiation skills for yourself. And right. what, you know, we should, because we, you know, I don't like to talk in terms of selling, but we're kind of a product, you know, and if you want this product, you got to, you get, you know, you pay for what you get and uh, what you're getting with me with Danielle is going to be someone who makes sure that this is the fair market rate for someone with my talent and experience. And that of course is always a little loose, but that's what we try to adjust towards. What is the fair market rate? Thanks for that observation, Danya. Anyone else? Everyone's too nervous about the election to answer, ask any questions. Okay, I'm going to move on then. So you got to know what you need versus what you want. Uh, I have had a very good financial planner and uh, he's all business charts and graphs. Uh, I've done very well just in a, you know, kind of a normal way of getting through all the ups and downs of the last 15 years or a little longer. And I was talking with him about how a person, person should estimate what they need to make. So it's really important for you right from the beginning when you are looking for a new job or you're deciding you need a promotion, um, what are your actual monthly expenses? You know, it's like just the manual work of calculating everything that you spend and then add about 30% for insurance, could be long-term insurance, uh, other specialty insurances that you might have and your savings, because you never know there could be a pandemic and you need savings because everything gets changed up. So that's roughly 30% more than your monthly expenses. So once you know that number, you don't tell anybody that because that's just between you and your bank account. So now you need to research what's reasonable in to ask for. And that could be quite a range of possibility. You never want to go below, go below that red line because then essentially you would be losing money. So this is, you know, like your focused attention to get what you deserve and to cover your expenses for the future to protect yourself. <clears throat> um, so the researching part is really important here. Uh, you need to look over what are typical free services that give you an idea of what's the fair market range for your salary in our area, wherever you live, uh, so that you can float around in this qualified ask for more than just what you need. 
So everybody in the negotiation world around jobs is talking in terms of a range, not a number, but a range. It's much better. So salary is really essential, as I said before, uh, because it's hard to raise your salary after you get in a position, unless you do something spectacular. Uh, the like annual um, increases have been low in Silicon Valley for quite some time. So you don't, you know, a lot of people moving into their next job are trying to catch up to where the market has gone and they haven't because 2% raise, you know, a one and a half percent raise, some people luck out with great performance and the company reimburses them for that. But a lot of people just are increment, very slowly incrementally raising their salary. So it's important to be able to negotiate for the best number of salary that you can get. The highest that is reasonable is what you ask for so that you are able to go lower and look like a good compromiser, never going near that red line. So that's in that qualified ask, you go as high as you perceive it's fair for you to go uh, so that you can come down in the spirit of a good negotiator and still make the amount that you feel you deserve, what you want. So above your need into your want. So recruiters often seek the mid range when you're coming in. So let's say this was grade 45 for a job. <clears throat> the maximum would be, I don't know, we could make up some numbers here. Like let's say the maximum were $200,000 and the minimum were 100, was 140,000. So they're looking for somewhere in that midpoint. Most recruiters are looking below the midpoint. So you have a lot of room to move up. And I suggest to you, depending on your years of experience, you wanna move, um, you wanna get that point uh, like towards three quarters, like between the midpoint and max is where you wanna go. So maybe you start just below the max and be willing to come down. And that might take a little bravado, a little extra courage, but it's a really good practice. And I've got many clients who are very successful doing this. So you need to do your research, as I said. So there are sites and um, you know people that you know who are working in your target companies. And sometimes they will give you an idea. They may not say how much they make, but they might say, you know, we're lower than most companies are for this particular kind of work in the Valley. I think you just have to get comfortable with that. We're not up there. Or someone else might say, Oh, we pay pretty high in the range because we work like you, we work you like hell. And we don't expect you to, you know, last here for too long because we burn people out. Sorry, I'm only kidding. Um, so let's look at the sites that you have access to for free. Salary.com, payscale.com, Glassdoor, LinkedIn. You have this in the handout, which is in the chat. And we generally have a PDF file of these slides available. There's not much more on the slides than is the outline that I already have for you in the chat. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, if you pay LinkedIn, LinkedIn just loves you to be very active on LinkedIn. The more you do for LinkedIn, the more LinkedIn will do for you. So um, <clears throat> if you pay them, uh, you will generally see the salary range in the job description that is posted. And all of these are, you know, like if you look at two or three sites, you're going to get a sense of what the common denominator is. Even better in some ways, if, if you have a friend who works in HR at, you know, a mid-sized to larger company, they have access uh, through their compensation group to a more expensive database that's more precise. Radford is one, there are many. So you could, if you know, you're friends with this person, say, hey, it would be such a help to me if uh, you know, I've done some searching at Glassdoor and Payscale, but could you look up this position in Silicon Valley, let's say a senior project manager, Silicon Valley with seven years experience, 
what is the, the range for that position in high tech, you know, just in general in technology? And they'll come back with their range um, if they will feel comfortable giving you that. And, you know, for a lot of people who are just leaving their company uh, and there isn't a policy against this, the HR people may help you out and say, oh yeah, like this is what you should be looking for in your next job. Sometimes they don't because it puts them in a, a kind of a awkward position that they're revealing something to you. But if you don't ask, you certainly will never get. That's one of the secrets of negotiation. Be ready to ask for what you need because if you don't, they're not going to prompt you to do it. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll take a pause here. Any questions about the range and um, what's fair and how you can feel more comfortable that you are just representing what is important to know for your position where we live? Um, does indeed.com give correct information about the range? Well, they give uh, their information. <laughs> Whether it's correct, we don't know. This is all going to be approximation. That's why looking at a couple of different sources will give you a better idea. And having more contacts through your networking at different companies, you may develop enough of a rapport where you could get that information, at least in general, from like what I was saying earlier. Um, the overview doc, is that in the chat? So it, Regina, you may not have gotten that document, but it's coming to you uh, because I think you, you came in before it was released into the chat. Uh, yeah, so Bob, this is Mridula. Uh, I, I did not get that too, to post it here. Oh, you, you didn't yeah. get it? Yeah, the same, uh, the breakout survey was attached twice. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Then, um, all right, then I will put it in there. So bear with me a second. So the breakout is in there twice, huh? Yeah, uh, someone uh, joined late. late. Mm -hmm. just like so I added it just now okay okay while you do that there is a question in the chat is it true that you should ask first ask the recruiter for what the starting salary is before giving them a range that way you can um, base the range of their baseline oh yeah just one second I'm just a terrible multitasker as I'm trying to find sure. things, you know. sorry not uh, didn't mean to rush here <laughs> Okay. Uh, so sorry, it's not easy to find these things sometimes when you need them. Okay, I think I can get it now. Okay, so I think, oh, not that one, yeah. Uh, okay. Oh. oh, this is terrible. Okay. Uh. Okay, there should be something in there. <laughs> okay. I think that's the right one, the right version for this group. Okay, so now I'll go back to, and let me know, Mirdula, if there isn't a new one in there. Uh, in there, are four, there are four new questions. I can read it for you. 
Oh no, I can see, I can see the questions. Okay. Okay. And but did you get the negotiating handout in there? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Is it true that you should first uh, ask the recruiter for what the starting before giving them a range? That way you can, yes, so it would be good. And this is a little bit delicate area. So by law in California, a company cannot ask you what you made at your last job. You guys probably know that. And the law also says that if you ask for the range for that job, they have to tell you. However, that might make you look like a demanding person. <laughs> so you want to build this rapport with the recruiter, if that's what the kind of negotiating you're doing. Way in the beginning, you want to make that recruiter your best friend. So whatever you can do to help them, because they can help you a lot. And when we get down to the point of um, negotiation, um, you could say, well, let's say before you get the negotiation, when the recruiter wants to know, should they continue to speak with you? or you, are you too expensive for this job? You could say something like, well, you know, I am above the median, below the maximum in Silicon Valley for this position with the years of experience I have. And then, you know, the game begins. The recruiter says, well, how much is that? <laughs> and you say, well, uh, you know, it's like what you'd find on all the websites. Um, the recruiter says, well, what exactly were you interested in? Well, um, you know, we've hardly begun talking about the particulars of the job. It might be helpful if you just told me your range. What is your range for this grade in this position? And if things go well, they give you the range and you say, we're good. I can fit in that range. You don't say a number, right? The first person to say the number locks it, whether it's high or low. So it's better to just go as... Um, vague as you can. Try not to commit to any certain number. Um, let's see. Yeah, because as Vanessa says, it would be good to have a range from them and then you can calculate. Remember, you're going in knowing what your red line is and what your qualified asking territory is. And you want to get as high as you can without seeming demanding or unrealistic so that you can come down a little. What if you made the mistake of telling the recruiter your exact salary uh, want, what you really want? How do you backtrack and save yourself? Asking uh, for a friend, of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, totally. Um, so uh, yeah, I actually had this, it's funny. <clears throat> Two cars ago, a car for my daughter, when we got out of that uh, car dealership, the sales manager who is called in to close the deal is going back and forth with me. And he said, oh, can I hire you? You're making me work too hard here. What, you know, do you need a job? So all I was doing is using some of these same friendly techniques of back and forth. Um, <clears throat> so recently I bought another car and I was dreading it. I was procrastinating because I just wasn't getting the energy for it. So I did some research and I found the car that I liked right close by actually. So I didn't have to drive 50 miles to get it. It was a brand new used car. And uh, I did what um, Odalie is saying. I did not, I dropped my guard. So I got them to a good range and I had the um, sales manager said, but we want to add these extra warranties. And I just said, no, 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 no. You know, that's, that's beyond, I don't need that. So he comes back and he has the whole selection of, and says, so um, this looks like it. And I said, yeah, that looks good. And he said, wow, that was easy. And that was a trigger to remind me that I made it too easy for him on the other side. So I said, um, you know, uh, the thing is that I really didn't want a white car and this is wider, it doesn't fit as easily in the garage. I think I have to just think about this a little bit more. Can I come back tomorrow uh, and just hold this deal just like it is? Well, of course there's a panic. 
I'm the only one in the sale in the showroom because the market has been down lately. So um, they brought the price down even more. So I'm saying this because I made a mistake and I backtracked. So if um, <clears throat> early on you say a number that's below what you really feel you deserve, then wait a little bit because you're not in the power position. So when they say they want you, you could say, well, I'm really interested in working on this team too. Like everything that I have been preparing myself for is perfect for this position and this team. And I've thought it through and I talked to my family and you're coming in too low for the value that I bring. I was very eager, you know, when I mentioned some uh, price points in there, but it's really not what's going to work for my family. How can we adjust this? So I feel more excited about the offer that you're giving me because right now I feel like I'm take, taking a step back. What could we do to make this more attractive for me? So this is the language of persuasion. What could we do? So I didn't say, can you give me more? No, we can't. What can we do to make this more attractive? Do you notice the difference? And when I use we, they want me to be a we. They want me to say, yes, I'm one of you. We're in this together. So I'm using that language during the negotiation. Um, you know, I really undersold myself. You might have seen on my resume that uh, result that I got in the upgrading of our entire network system. Uh, just because of my work, the company saved over a million dollars last year. That's why I feel I'm closer to the top of the range because I get the kind of results that make a difference. How can we arrange things so that you're working within your limits and I'm getting the value that I deserve? So I'm asking for a collaboration. Do you guys get that? So this is the kind of way to speak in these terms. You're really excited. You want to be part of the team. You're ready to go. And the offer is not so great. So we, you know, see coming up, uh, yeah, I'll save that. Talk a little bit more about specific words to use and things. Um, I have a question too, when you can get to me about salary ranges. Okay. Dean, do you want to um, unmute? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay, Bob. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so you touched a bit on, uh, I guess, uh, the business side of their, their ranges and compensation. Um, I was kind of curious about this in the past, and I kind of tried to do some reading and thinking more from the perspective of human resources and learning some of how they construct pay ranges and uh, learned a bit about something I think they call in their world like the, the comp ratio or the compa ratio is that mm -hmm. um so what i found was kind of the messaging was that they try and sort of set their their goal for what they hire people to be something around i think they said like a 0.9 or like a 90 percent compa ratio and that their their hundred percent of a compa ratio would kind of be their mid range for a range that they define does that kind of jive from what uh you have had experience with and yeah yeah i mean i use a simpler kind of um representation of it but they the recruiters are under the direction of the compensation group which sets the mark for the year you know their budget uh, as well as they can predict the year of what the ranges will be and how much of that range can be consumed by a department, for instance. That's why, you know, a recruiter might say, I'm sorry, but I'm really limited. We can't go that high. Oh, really? Sometimes uh, the hiring manager, um, for instance, I might say, oh yeah, I'm really sorry you have that limit. I think I need a little bit more time to uh, think this over uh, and, I'd like to talk to Tom, who's the hiring manager. Is it okay if I give him a call um, 
just for like 10 minutes, I want to clarify something that might make a difference in my response to the offer. And if Tom really wanted me on the team soon, I may say to Tom, if they allow me to have access to him, because I don't want to kind of go behind their back and say, Tom, this is, this is good, but you know, I'm so ready to go and they're really limiting me here. I, I, it's going to take me a while to get back up to where I should be. Uh, what can we do about this? Is there some option that could be considered? So I could talk to the hiring manager who doesn't have as much uh, effect on the budgets of the compensation department, but who could say, look, let's make it up somewhere else. We really need this person. You know, because if the hiring manager really wants you in, in the traditional company, it's going to be different at Google and Facebook where they have a whole different hiring scheme. But um, yeah, I think you could try to get more than the comp ratio might allow. Uh, why not? If you don't try for certain, you never would. Okay, a follow up on that, a little now that you gave some more context. Yeah. Um, so I think what I read said that you should try and kind of focus for trying to get like, uh, maybe the maximum you might get would be like, um, like 10% over the comp ratio. I'm not sure that seems kind of, it sounds like it's kind of a low possibility, especially when you're talking more of a, a wider range in a more abstract manner without fixing any numbers and whatnot. Um, I was wondering if, if I brought up stuff that's kind of more like technical at this level to like the same sort of HR language, would they think that that would be, uh, kind of scary on their point that somebody knew about this stuff? Yeah. Or maybe a little presumptive, you know, like it might put them in an uncomfortable position. Yeah. Um, if you could express the, uh, the theory in a little more practical terms that might work better because you know what's happening, but you could express it in not their terms, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And again, in all of these things, it's the read of the person you're negotiating with. How are they doing? You know, really being there in the room or on screen with them, looking at their facial reactions, you know, are they with me? Are they really excited about making this work? Or are okay. they, you know, sometimes you get a recruiter who's more transactional and not relational, which makes it less enjoyable. They're just, you know, getting their numbers. But um, the relational recruiters are great because they know if you're the right person and they get you in there, they look good, you know, so they want you to get that position too. So they have to defend there's so the company side, but still try to pull you in as much as you can. Okay. Yeah. And I guess it depends on what type of recruiter you're talking to. If it's like an external one or an internal one, right? right. What, uh, I, I was going to ask about like who might have most control over how much they could pay you and the budgets that you were kind of alluding to as well. And I, I guess it also depends on, again, what, what type of recruiter they are. But um, let's say if it was internal and you were in a, if you're, if you're in an interview, I guess you're, you're speaking to the, the sort of the internal recruiter and maybe the hiring manager and you've got an offer on the table, um, who has control over if you said, well, this is really not enough and you were asking for something higher. Is that, does this jar hold the budget? numbers more or does the hiring manager how does that decision go internally in a company well I, I think it depends on the company to some extent um and i would say whoever is negotiating with you is the main person you should be working with and they may have to, they may have to go to the higher level to get permission to do something that you ask and they may be willing to do that because they really want you in that spot so, uh, you know, if it's a match, it's a match. And they really want you to say yes. So they will adapt to a certain degree, wh whatever flexibility is allowed. And sometimes there is no flexibility 
and the market's not doing so well. So, you know, I might say, well, I'm going to take this job. Uh, you know, I could say, you know, here's, well, you know, going ahead a little bit, but I'll take it now at the risk of being undervalued so that we can continue the discussion over the course of the next year to see how soon I can get to the level that um, is fair for me. You know, like I'd take on some risk if I have some idea of how I could go a little faster through the growth path. So we'll get into that more, Dean. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, the number of years of experience is slightly subjective. Do internships count? Part-time work, <laughs> what should I count? What do recruiters count? Oh, that's great. Yeah, you should see my daughter's resume and LinkedIn. She just graduated from college. <laughs> and we, we went through every one of those volunteer activities. She didn't get a salary, but she got some good results and great experience. So yes, um, yeah, internships, uh, part-time work, volunteer work, all those things count uh, as far. And what really counts is how well what you've done matches what they need to be done. People want to hire somebody who's already done this. You know, if it's a, a, a starting position and a person has done it voluntarily, that's great. I mean, actually my work in a uh, nonprofit government supported career transition organization got me my last full-time corporate job. I mean, spent a lot of time volunteering, doing all kinds of managerial things and doing workshops. It gave me the experience I needed to get that next position. And um, it'll come down to how clever you are when you are uh, <clears throat> negotiating, how much you can ratchet that up a little bit from where they start. But yeah, I would put your best foot forward. You know, unfortunately, many people downplay their successes. You know, many people say, I was just part of a team. Well, you know, you're negotiating, negotiating for one person at this point. So you have to uh, make it clear what influence you had to get the results that you got. Okay. What is the average fair decision time a recruiter should give to the candidate? Is it a week, two weeks? <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, Fair and just are not words often used in the career transition world. It so makes a difference who you're talking with, what their corporate culture is, what the market is. But uh, generally when they make an offer to you, they wanna know as soon as possible. Like they want you to say yes. And if it's not the offer you really want, or even if it is, I would say, I need a little time to talk this over, think it through. I'm very excited about it. I just want to process a few more things with my family. And I'd like to get back to you on Wednesday because I actually have another offer that's coming in tomorrow. And I want a little time to be able to balance the two. You have another offer coming in. Uh, yes, yeah, if, you know, and one behind that that may be coming, but I'm very interested in working here at Apple. So, you know, I just need to think over how this offer and the prestige of the company compares to the other possibilities I have. So it doesn't hurt to show that you're marketable, if you know what I mean. And basically you're saying, I am, I am offering my talent and experience and lots of people are interested in me. And I'm very interested in you. So how can we work this out that I take your offer? So it might sound a little gutsy, a little bold. It might be uncomfortable. Get comfortable with it in a respectful, pleasant, courteous, assertive way. Um, yeah, so sometimes you can ask for more time. Uh, so, Bob, we'd like to know uh, tomorrow, would that be okay to get back to us? Uh, you know, it's going to be too soon, um, Monday. So how about Friday? Can that work for you? Friday's really stretching it. Oh, really? Um, so Thursday afternoon could work? Yeah, Thursday could work. If you need more time, ask for it. Um, and 
through all of this, remember your gut response. If your gut says, I really want to work with these people, I want to do this, this kind of work for them. I love the mission of this company. This is a fair market offer. I could try to inch it up more, but do I need to do that? Everything's looking good. Maybe I could ask for a little more startup, you know, uh, encouragement, which we're going to get to next. So I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, and as Regina said, the documents are, two different documents are in the chat, uh, the yeah. handout and the breakout session. Yeah, if someone doesn't uh, have the doc, they can message me, I can send them privately. But okay. they're both posted uh, in the chat window. Okay, thanks, Merdula. So yeah, just do a private chat to Merdula and um, she'll send it your way. Okay, so it's important that um, we remember that compensation is more than salary and salary is like number one to get that right because it's hard to change as I mentioned. But there are things like a sign-on bonus. It gets taxed all at once, but it's still helpful. A retention bonus, that's usually, you know, when you're there one year, you get so much money. When you're there two years, at the end of the second year, you get more money. That is an incentive to keep people, you know, with the company. So those are things, they're kind of secondary in a way, but they are something, if you can't get the salary, then that might be something that the um, negotiator has in their toolkit. Uh, also, from your research, it would be good to know, ideally, you know people in this company, does everybody get a performance-based company bonus annually? Because that's going to make a difference and will help. And in your previous job, sometimes people got a generous bonus every year. Doesn't mean they're going to get it in the next company. So you want to check in these things and see how it fits in your all over need as far as your expenses and savings and getting above to grow your um, compensation base. Uh, so I started to say this before, like let's say they, they can't, because of their constraints, they cannot go above, oh, and I go quiet. So this is something I'll mention again later, but I just go kind of quiet. Well, Bob, um, uh, are you okay? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm just uh, surprised. So you really cannot go above that uh, to where I feel my value is. And I am so excited about this possibility. I'm willing to take the risk of coming in lower than I should. If I have a good degree of confidence that you will allow me an actual performance review in six months rather than a year, and you will see what I'm contributing and that I would be eligible for a salary increase and possibly a grade increase. Is that something that is within the realm of possibility here? And they might say, yeah, we don't do it much, but I think so. Let me get back to you, but I think we should be able to work on that. Well, that would be fantastic because that makes a big difference for me. I realize how constrained you are and I think you realize that I'm not that comfortable with where I'm coming in, knowing typically the way salaries progress. So having that six month review would make a big difference for me. I'm totally confident that I can show you my contribution within six months that really justifies me being at the higher level. So um, there are other things too that might be important like, um, maybe a relocation. Uh, you weren't planning on relocating, but this commute is terrible. And you realize that you need to get closer to this. Well, I don't know, is this an issue anymore? It may not be for another year or so. <laughs> the commute is from one room in your house to the other, but that used to be something we would put in there. It might make a difference and getting help, getting closer to work is a good thing. Um, benefits. So let's say I have a couple of dependents and we're really used to Palo Alto Medical Foundation. 
And this company does not have that in their package. I could say, well, one thing that will make a difference to me is if I could keep my current um, medical coverage and you just pay me my premium, I'll show you what the monthly premium is and you just add that to my salary and I'll take care of my own health care. Sometimes that can work with companies. Um, so, you know, shared jobs, some people who are very family oriented want to have a more reasonable time at work and can afford a shared job position. Uh, tuition reimbursement, you know, um, there may be an objection early in the interview process, but you're not certified as a scrum master, are you? And I say, well, not yet, but I want to be as soon as possible. Uh, I've really admired a couple of friends who are scrub ma scrum masters, and uh, we talk about how things are uh, so much more predictable and productive. So I would be eager to do that uh, if the company could help me early when I start and perhaps help with the tuition. I would be completely focused and put that investment to work very soon. I did read a couple of good books and I'm fascinated about this aspect of scrum teams. And if this recruiter understood that, you could have a conversation showing you're not that far off from being certified. You know, you can make up for it with your own research. Okay. So you've heard a little bit of this. Curiosity, possibility, respect are really important in this. Even if you do get a little insulted, let's say, you just think, wow, they really came too low. Uh, so just be matter of fact, oh, you know, oh, that's so much lower than what I need uh, based on the value that I'm going to bring. That's so much lower. Oh, it is, Bob? Well, how much lower would is it? And I said, well, you know, I mentioned before I was more towards the top. So this makes it much less attractive for me. Yeah. How could we work around this? You know, so your value you need to mention, go back to your successes and how you've helped previous companies. Always keep your excitement about the job, which is separate from your not excitement about the package they're offering. You know, there's a difference. I can still be excited about the people I met and working for this manager and in this company and not be so excited about compensation. So these previous quantifiable successes that I mentioned, you know, last year I saved Hewlett Packard over a million dollars in unnecessary training, and this offer is $15,000 lower than fair market value for someone of my experience. I just, it's surprising to me. Because I intend to drive business in my position like I have in my earlier jobs and just recently, as I mentioned at Hewlett Packard. Um, so willingness to share risk is an example of a collaborative language. Uh, I'll come in a little bit lower if I feel that you will review me sooner. Can we collaborate on that sort of how it is? Then. Uh, remember these three key questions that are always underneath any interview question that you get asked. Can you do this work that we need done? Do you really want to? And will you fit in with us? That's it. Those are the three basic ones that are underneath everything. So you want to mention this. I'm so excited about this position and this team. I know I can get the results. I heard about the deadline pressure you're under now. I've done this before, and I really admire the values that I've heard from everybody in the interview process. Uh, it, this just seems like a really great place to work. I just want to make sure I'm getting my fair value for what I'm going to contribute. So um, in my coaching, we call this the hierarchy of ideas. Um, chunking up means to go to a higher level where we all can understand things. And chunking down is where a, a data scientist will take you deep into an algorithm. And many of us cannot go with them there. They are down in the details. So in negotiation, when you get stuck in a detail, remember to go back up 
to what we have in common, uh, reminding people the mutual value that's ahead. So here are a couple of general examples. My current compensation now and my career trajectory, where I want to be in three years, can I continue doing this job at this growth rate and knowing where I need to be in three to four years? So if I don't see a path, then I need to do something about it on my own, right? So I may be out looking for a job while I'm working a job. Here's another example. Um, in the negotiation, the mission and values of their company and the help that you bring for them to accomplish it. You know, so if you get stuck in the details about the finances, you could say, yeah, but I still think about this project that I, a friend of mine who works here told me about that I so admire because those are exactly the kinds of values that motivate me to do my best work. Uh, I'm sure we should be able to figure out some way to come in between your constraint and my need. How might we do this? Okay. So uh, before we go into a breakout, which will only be um, brief, give each person about three minutes to practice just saying something that you might not normally say in a negotiation situation. So if you have the document from the chat room, just open it up on breakout. And it's not a lot of information there. It just says each person is going to be the recruiter and the candidate and you'll switch. So we'll put you into the breakout room and give you a warning signal at three minutes that you should switch to the other person to play that role. And then we'll give you a warning session at two minutes for the second person because Zoom automatically gives you another minute. So each person will have roughly three minutes. So look at the handout and um, look it over now if you can. And I'm open for any questions uh, to investigate before you go into the breakout. So I wanna make sure that it makes sense to you, that you feel comfortable to be able to go in with possibly a complete stranger <laughs> and practice negotiating, because it can be kind of stressful. So there's a description of the situation. Uh, when you start, you just have to say, uh, if you're the candidate, uh, what kind of a position you're going for. And the recruiter has some prompt lines. Well, we're constrained by budget. We need to start you at a place where you can grow. We typically need to see your results at this level first or at this compensation level first. And the candidate's going to be defending their need for a higher level with questions um, well, with points like, how would they know that you can do what they most need done? How do you promote your expertise? So I gave you some examples of that. What successes can you bring to mind that support your request, your justification? And then are there other aspects of the package that could make this a more attractive offer for the candidate? So um, anyone have any, uh, need any more details about that before we go into breakout? So the thing is, when we go into breakout, I hope you'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean break out of the whole session, but just this. So it's great when you hear yourself saying these words, you know, you could say exactly the words I said, you could modify them to your style. You could say what you've heard someone up, but you need to start saying these things out loud to build your confidence that you can do this. And it becomes much more natural. So with that, and then when we come back together, we'll discuss the whole process a bit. And I have a few parting uh, tips too. So it's not gonna be a long time, just give it a shot. Uh, I'm not into perfection. The rougher, the better, just give it a, a try. 
So, uh, Merdula, yeah, can you? Chart. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, a couple of people had to drop off. <laughs> yeah. So, let's see, even if there are just like four people left, we could still do two practice rooms. Okay, I moved a few people just to see if, yeah, okay, and I can move this person to fifth. So there's one person who's um, odd, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you like, I can go in with that person. Okay, sure. And you keep track of the three minutes and do you know how to do that in the breakouts? You type that little message in the bottom and say, please switch. Yes, I can do that, yeah. Okay, good. And then I said that as a reminder, Zoom always puts an extra minute in. So at two mm -hmm. minutes, you should end it and then we'll be done by three, okay? Okay, okay. So right. uh, I put you... Oh, actually, I put you on a, a breakout room, but uh, there are already two people in that room. So I think you can skip. Okay. So we're good? Yeah. Okay. Great. So everybody's in a room now who's left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have three rooms. Oh, good. Six people made it through. Yes. <laughs> Well, we got some um, good questions back and forth, so that mm -hmm. was Yeah, yeah, we had uh, 20 people uh, when it was peak. Oh. And uh, yeah, it's only um, maybe towards the end, like from uh, after 6.30 is when we uh, saw people dropping off. Well, some, you know, I, I do question about it. Sure. Okay, I think we have everyone back. Okay. Um, are you guys all back? Yep. All right, thank That's you. Great. Thanks for the... It was a good session. Great. So that's what I'd like to hear about. How did it go? Like, what did you learn? Uh, mm, did it feel a little better than you thought it would? Anyone want to share? Um, I thought it was a good experience to act as a recruiter because I'm realizing that I want to keep the candidate happy, you know? So when they tell me that they're unhappy with the offer I've given them, um, I'm trying my best to, you know, appease them and um, make them as happy as possible. So that was uh, enlightening for me. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard job being a recruiter. A lot of people don't last too long doing it. Um, sometimes these recruiters have, you know, more than 50 jobs at the same time they're hiring for. It can be really so. And I think this goes to your um, advantage in having that awareness, which will come out beyond your words when you're talking with recruiters, they will know that you get it, like what's going on with them. And that will make the whole rapport so much more natural, I think, for you and a positive, I think. So thanks, Odalie. Anyone else have a observation from the experience? Um, it was really hard. Yes. Yeah. But I think it was good to just like have the practice of being able of saying those things out loud, which was the whole point of the exercise. And um, who is this speaking? Let me see if I can. Oh, this is Lisa Ann. Okay. Yeah. Lisa Ann, what would you say was the hardest part of it for you? Um, having to make the recruiter unhappy by, by pushing back. 
<laughs> you know, that's a really interesting uh, phrase that you used because, you know, it's my observation that we can't make somebody happy or sad. They choose to have that reaction. <laughs> but we are taught growing up that it was our fault. <laughs> If it wasn't for you, I'd be so happy or whatever. And so it's good to keep in mind just being yourself, naturally sticking up for what you've been able to observe is realistic, is just presenting, you know, the case. And however they take it, they take it. You know, um, just by doing these kind of workshops, you're far ahead of the game for a lot of people who are going to be negotiating and interviewing. Um, there is no training in this for most people uh, around good negotiation or even interviewing. So by participating in these kind of sessions, you really get um, a stronger position when you're in that situation. And again, as I emphasize, being respectful, curious, and assertive that you just want to, it, you want it to be a match on both sides. Thanks, Lisa. Anyone else? And I think another thing that I realize is that as a recruiter, you know, you're just trying your best to represent your company. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a candidate, if I push back, I feel like the recruiter shouldn't take it personally because they're just doing their job, you know, and and, right. I'm, I, and I just want what I want. Um, so it helps to know that I think the recruiter won't be mad if I ask for more, you know, it, it's realizing right. that, putting that into perspective for me is helpful right now. That's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, because uh, we imagine all kinds of things. And the the interesting thing is that each one of us human beings knows what reality is. It's what we perceive reality to be. So that if you get 10 of us in a room, there are 10 different realities. So the only thing we can do is express ourselves in a uh, friendly way um, that represents our work in this area, like getting ready to negotiate. And, you know, we hope that the other person, and you can even preempt things like, oh, um, I hope that didn't seem um, uh, t demanding to you or disrespectful because it was not my intention at all. I'm really impressed with how we've been dealing with this. It's just that I do need to represent my best interests too. And I appreciate the limitations that you may have. I'm just trying to see how can we make this really work on both sides? So you have to believe and know that's true in order for the other person to believe it. You know, so if I were trying to scam the recruiter and get more, I wouldn't really be very believable. Not that many people are such good actors that their real intention doesn't come through. You know, so I think when you fall back into your natural stronger self, and this is where many of us have to like get over the nervousness or, you know, can I really ask for that? Absolutely you can. Yeah, there's a good book called Brag, how to toot your horn without blowing it. <laughs> and for those of us who had trouble speaking up, you know, about what's fair. <laughs> Any other comments from the group before we go on? I just kind of had like a thought, maybe observation. Okay. In on a couple of other, I've been kind of hopping into some of these sorts of things now more frequently. And I've been trying to kind of get into more of the side from like the HR um, side of things. And I found, I heard a lot of recruiters talking a lot about risk. Like they, they'll, they'll frequently, and they don't kind of talk about it. It's kind of almost, they talk about it as sort of disembodied, like, they don't really make it clear, but it seems like when they talk about risk, at all, well, I perceive it as they're kind of like thinking a lot of from like their own perspective. Everybody's in their own head. It's all about me kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it can't, I have a hard time kind of like 
connecting to like what they're what they're really sort of getting at and it seems like they're sort of thinking all about the perspective of like the risks to them or i almost i almost pick up like it's their whole job basically is then thinking about their reputational risk I, is all i can sort of assess uh, in being a recruiter and like how, who they present to managers you know for interviews and whatnot that's the risk that they're talking about but they're always assessing the risk of the candidate and i don't know if you have more perspective on that it's kind of an early things well i mostly add that there's so many different kinds of recruiters and companies and compensation groups, you know? So I don't think we could say categorically that they're all risk uh, focused, but some may be. And so if you heard the, the recruiter use the word risk or talk about protecting or anything that's security oriented, then do make a point of using that language back, you know? I hope you realize that by my joining the group, the risk of missing that deadline goes down dramatically. Uh, what I've done in the past to protect deadlines and to get extra resources has made all the difference. I'm just making this up on the fly, but you know what I mean? If you pick up, if you're listening to the other person, they will say words that show what's really important to them. So like Dean points out, risk may be a big issue. And so <laughs> it's still just a person to person talking. And if you use language that helps to calm them down from the feeling of risk in this case, and if you are also kind of calm in your demeanor, they are gonna pick it up from you also. Your confidence in a calmness will come across. And uh, it, you know, it's just something we practice to get better at. No one's perfect at this stuff when they start doing it. But no, I don't have any overall uh, idea about recruiters and risk in general. They're just trying to do their job, which is to bring the right candidate in that uh, at the price that's fair with the compensation group and if they run into a problem where the candidate says that's not fair, that they are willing to look at some alternatives to make that candidate happier so they will join. Yeah, I've had a number of clients who use this basic negotiation method and they get great results. You can't predict it all the time because we just don't, we can't control what happens out there. We can only control ourselves and what we bring to the table and our deep intention to be fair in this and to get fairness back, you know, to be, to front with your accomplishments, quantifiable, your energy, enthusiasm, how your values match. And, um, you know, one of the best questions to ask in an interview, especially towards the end when they say, do you have any questions? Yes, I was. I, I'm very curious. If you got the absolute best candidate for this job, how would things be different here six months from now? So that is what's called a powerful question, how or what? It's not a yes, no. Now, it's going to cause the person to start thinking and their eye movement will show you when they've left you and they've gone into their own head like this or this or this, <laughs> they are imagining in whatever uh, you know, uh, method that they prefer, whether it's sounds or pictures or gut feeling, and what they say after is golden. Well, I'll tell you one thing, I wouldn't have to be doing all this damn stuff myself, I would be more strategic. So the response to that would be, wow, if you got the right candidate six months from now, you could be more strategic. You wouldn't have to do all these extra things yourself. Exactly. That's what I'm reading, that you get it. <laughs> so you might think that I was being a parrot and using the same words back, but since that person had gone and thoughtful inside their head and spoke those, they're not really with me totally. And so when I say the words back exactly, 
it's like speaking to their unconscious mind in a way. It's like going into that same place where they just were. And you're using their words, which is so reassuring, really reassuring. So if you did that all the time and it was very obvious, you know, it wouldn't be a very good sales technique. But if you are uh, paying attention, listening, and you use some of those words back, and what I'm espousing here is a little different than active listening. That was big some years ago. Active listening is you hear everything the person says, and then you put it in your own words and say it back. You own it then. But I'm saying direct listening is saying those words right back to them. And that person's going to say, you really get it. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a bit of NLP. <laughs> That's Dean. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And NLP is the basis of all uh, sales training. And it's not natural language processing neuro-linguistic programming. And um, it really makes sense. It works. It's used in a lot of different um, disciplines. But it, what it is, it's all about building rapport. So just remember, using some of those words back shows that you really heard what the person was saying. OK, I uh, guess we better race ahead a little bit. Uh, yeah. We did. Our, so I, I am compelled to mention this because I still, it still influences me. So in negotiating, in interviewing, in persuading someone, there are three ways that we speak in traditional English or American, as we probably would say here, whatever that language is, it seems to be different everywhere you go. When asking a question, it goes up. Would you like to go to the movies tonight? You know, there's sort of upswing. Then there's a statement. There's a good movie in town, neutral. Then there's a command, get your coat on. We're all going to the movies now. So that's the military command. The voice just dropped down. So it's good to keep this in mind. Um, back uh, in the realm of NLP, we use this, we play around with this differently. Uh, to get a positive result. But what I hear so much now often, especially with younger people and especially um, kind of tribal language, you know, the way people speak to one another in a very relaxed way, um, it's called up speaking or up talking. And um, I realized recently, because it's hard for me to do it uh, on the fly and it really works um, as a um, printed version. So normally I would say, I'm confident I can make this deadline. You notice the confidence is the sound of my voice went down. I'm confident that in six months, you will see the results that I bring that show my value. It's going down a lot. Uh, now, if I were to say the same thing in up speaking, it would be, I'm confident I can make this deadline. You know, there's like this little tentative thing to it. I'm sure we can do that. Am I? <laughs> so um, you, this may resonate with you. You may not know what I'm talking about, but you'll hear it all over once you start paying attention to it. And I've had very impressive clients who do up speak and I have to bring it to their attention because it may work with the group of people who report to you who do a lot of up speaking, but it may not work in order to impress the higher management about your uh, grade increase coming up. If you have any questions about that, <laughs> uh, I'll watch the chat too. So here's um, a few books that I found very uh, helpful lately. The Gifts of Imperfection. So for many of us, um, vulnerability is difficult because we have to be perfect. And so if someone would find out that we're not perfect, that would be disaster. Then Designing Your Life, which uh, is a wonderful uh, book based on the work of two professors, one in engineering, one industrial design at Stanford, and it's a, 
you know, there are not actually coaches who will coach people in designing your life method. I'm uh, certified to teach Crucial Conversations, wonderful book about language. And I do believe at the basis of that is NLP for sure. <laughs> um, Selling the Invisible is a good book for anyone who's looking to be more persuasive, especially as a consultant or as an internal advisor, because all of us, for the most part in this country, are offering and providing services. It's not product so much. It's a service that we come to bring, and that's invisible. So this is a great book about how to represent yourself. The One Thing by Gary Keller is about looking for the, the thing that has the most impact in order to get your promotion. You have one-on-ones with your manager and you just say casually, yeah, what's the most important thing our group should accomplish this uh, quarter? You know, you ask to find out what it is, you know, and if I, that's a powerful question. What is the, that person may go in their head thinking, and repeat those words back. Oh, so we really need to expedite the uh, backlog reduction. That's been taking too long. Okay, I can work on that. Um, this book is really good for people who are have achieved quite a lot and they're not sure they wanna keep doing the same thing. It's not as rewarding. David Brooks, The Second Mountain. I've been recently getting into um, positive intelligence. It's new to me. I've been taking a uh, coach's training. Fantastic stuff. It's a book, a website, and a TED talk by the uh, inventor, as it were, positive intelligence. Um, Mindset, you probably know from uh, Carol Dweck, really excellent book for lots of things, even parenting. Uh, a growth mindset makes all the difference. Most of us want to work for a growth mindset manager, not a fixed mindset manager. And Dean added, Chris Voss, never split the difference. Oh, never split the difference. Cool. So I, that's new to me. I'll check that out. All right. Uh, that brings us close to the end here. Yep. Uh, nothing ever goes away until it has taught us what we need to know. That is a really good, healthy, positive intelligence perspective on life. Everything, no matter what it is, has something for us to learn. And uh, yeah, and I use uh, unsplash.com for a lot of the pictures, although that one is my own camera that's on the screen now. And don't I wish I could have those oysters tonight, but I'm <laughs> able to. Um, so unsplash.com is a great resource. Ah. <laughs> so Chris added in the chat, a former FBI hostage negotiator. Definitely got to re read this. <laughs> okay. So uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for your participation, especially Merdula for hanging in there and the technical support. It's been a real pleasure tonight. Hope things work out tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> I won't say who I'm I'm praying for, but I am praying. And uh, I'll see you next year. Probably we'll have another one of these. So yeah, have thank a you. great rest of the year. Yeah, th thank you, Bob. Um, this whole uh, series starting from like brand value, resume, and then LinkedIn profile interviewing and now negotiation. This provided like a comprehensive set of resources while we consider our next opportunity. And th thank you for the wonderful coaching and training. Uh, and thanks everyone for staying in so late. Uh, we'll see you next year then. I'm going to post uh, the recording uh, on WebD blog, maybe in like a week or two. Uh, so check back. All right, thank you. Okay, have a good night. Take care. All right. Thank good you. Night. The sound of departure.